It is an absolute honor for me to be here and to work with you all today. So I'd like to begin with um, expectations. Perhaps you're expecting that uh, a presentation that follows the academic conventions that were in the conference presentations, although I should add now that um, Juan did such a great job at communicating um, sci uh, what, what we're gonna talk about today, science communication. Perhaps you're not expecting academic um, conventions after all, but in any case, since this workshop aims to introduce you to different styles of communication for sustainability, my presentation will be somewhat of a mix between academic style and a style geared towards a more general audience um, like um, Juan's presentation um, showed. So um, in this way, I hope not only to provide you all with guidelines on how to communicate sustainable mobility, but to demonstrate it through the presentation style. So one of the major issues that we deal with on a regular basis when we communicate in general, and often when we have conversations um, about topics and sustainability, is when our worldview clashes with another person's worldview. So how do we talk to each other without ending the conversation in complete frustration or worse? This question is the basis for the workshop, but we'll have to work towards answering that question in several steps. I'll begin the presentation um, introducing a few basics of communicating and connecting with your audience. I'll introduce you to the difference between communicating to experts and non-experts in, in sustainability in general. And I'll give you some specific examples of communicating to non-experts from the realm of sustainable mobility. Since the topic came up yesterday of whether or not everybody is an expert on mobility, I would like to say for this workshop, perhaps we're all know-it-alls about certain aspects of mobility within our own lives. However, since I have not studied uh, sustainable mobility, and although I work directly with sustainability experts, I still would consider myself and many others who have not sus studied sustainable mobility non-experts. Okay, so after I introduce examples of communication strategies from actors within sustainable mobility, I'll end the presentation part of this workshop by introducing bridge building exercises that can be used when communicating with those who have a different opinion. For the remainder of the workshop, um, you'll practice how to understand and communicate with people who are not exactly excited about sustainable mobility because they feel attached to less sustainable modes of transportation for one reason or another. Okay, so the first thing we need to do when communicating is to understand our audience as best as you can. The time it takes to research your audience cannot be underestimated, but look at this as an investment. After all, the benefits gained from successful communication cannot be underestimated either. As an example, I'm just gonna walk you through the, the research and preparation required for understanding this audience, you. So before beginning the prep for this workshop, I researched the context in which our communication would take place. I watched videos from the former meetings on YouTube to get a feeling for the atmosphere of the conferences so that my contribution would hopefully fit in somewhat style-wise. I also read the web pages of the two Berlin Microenergy Systems Research Group so that I could find out about the group's goals and approaches. And when I read the words bottom up on the web pages, I knew that those words would be the key to the structure of this workshop. Then I asked lots of questions about you. Are you students? What are you studying? Are you in Berlin? What is your experience with communication, et cetera? And some of these, e these questions were easily answered and some weren't, but that's how preparation goes. You'll never have all the answers, but at least you'll be a lot more prepared than if you hadn't done any research on your audience at all. So after I had devised the first version of the presentation, I sought out feedback to make sure my messages were clear. So I wanna thank Noara and Xenia, as well as my family for putting so much time and thought into the feedback they all gave me. 
um, my own daughter had to listen twice um, <laughs> and gave me her feedback uh, from the point of view of a 16 year old, which was very helpful. Okay, so um, then I attended most of the conference papers yesterday. Unfortunately, I couldn't uh, uh, attend all of them because of other TU meetings that I had to attend. Um, but I took detailed notes so as I could, so as to delete information from this presentation that you already demonstrated that you know about communication, as well as to connect this presentation better to the topics that you're working on in particular. So after you've done research and preparation, you'll need to figure out the best way to communicate and connect with your audience. As I said earlier, I decided um, that a mix would be best for this audience. So in adhering to the academic conventions of first defining terminology, I'll first define the words communicate and connect as I will use them in this workshop. Here, the meaning of communicate is to share or exchange news, information, ideas, feelings, etc. Notice that I've put in bold the word feelings. Um, according to biologist E.O. Wilson, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. In other words, we're dealing with very basic emotions and feelings that have not really evolved, institutions and infrastructure that take forever to change, and technology that has evolved at such a pace that many of us don't understand it, but perhaps we believe in it or have faith in it. This topic of emotions um, came up yesterday and today, which I'm very happy about. Uh, I was fascinated to hear in yesterday's uh, mobility behavior presentation that emotional factors were much more important than rational factors in the Berlin survey. And I was also fascinated to hear in yesterday's gender and mobility presentation that in addition to the real gender-based crime, that perceived safety plays a role in females' decisions regarding mobility. We need to take that seriously because even though we may wish that individuals act on rationality and knowledge, the reality is oftentimes people just don't. So it's crucial for successful communication to understand and more importantly, accept that basic emotions and different perceptions or perspectives often drive decision-making. Also important today are the words to share and common, um, which I have bolded here in put in bold in the etymology, which just means the origin of the word communicate. When we're communicating bottom up, sharing means cooperating, collaborating, and common means finding common ground, similarities, having common status, whether that is socially and economically, et cetera, um, building metaphorical bridges to those with a different opinion, and finding a common language and style for communicating. So when communicating bottom up, sharing is not competitive as in debating, and it is not authoritative as in the top-down model. And when communicating bottom up, common is not hierarchical as in the top-down model. This is extremely important. Um, another, word I would like to define is to connect. As you all have an interest in mobility, the first definition that you might think of is join. As in the example sentence, the towns are connected by train and bus services. In this workshop, of course, we'll be dealing with the Oxford de uh, definition for communication, not mobility, namely to form a good relationship with someone so that you like and understand each other. In the context of this workshop, liking the person who has a different opinion is wonderful, but it's not the ultimate goal. Understanding each other, that is the goal in connecting in this context. In the previous slide, I've implicitly introduced one of the basic strategies for communication, 
namely connecting through association. What I've done is I started by introducing a prompt, which is one piece of information which can be known, concrete, familiar, or easy. And then I added another piece of information, the message that I want to send. This message might be unknown, abstract, unfamiliar, or difficult to understand. Of course, those are not the cases in my example. I used a very simplistic example, but this is the case, um, especially when you're dealing with scientific topics or technical topics. Um, by beginning with a prompt, then you make your message more accessible, user friendly, et cetera, to your audience, as you see in the example for mobility to join and for communication to form a relationship. Before I move on to some of the other strategies to connect with your audience, I want to provide an overview of how to connect best with your audience in order to form a relationship based on understanding. Connect by understanding your audience's attitude towards the topic, expectations, and if you have to go against those expectations or you want to go uh, against those expectations, tell your audience what they should expect, as I've done regarding the style in this presentation. Connect with your audience by respecting their voice listening empathetically, taking them seriously, as with the fear mentioned in the gender presentation regarding perceived danger rather than real statistics of danger. Connect with your audience by reflecting on your own values and perspectives. We're talking global here in Zigni, so you need to understand that your values and perspectives are yours because you also have to reflect on other people's values and perspectives, which may be completely different than yours. And then the tricky part, as Juan said, is finding ground between the two. And in order to do that, building bridges is extremely important, as well as building trust. Okay, so let's look at building bridges for a moment, or for several moments, actually. Scott Shigeoka states, to bridge differences, you usually need to start by accepting that you don't have all the answers or a monopoly on the truth. This can be difficult for experts who are used to communicating with the top-down model, but it is essential when communicating with the bottom-up model. And it is especially important today concerning the many people who have lost confidence, sadly, in science and scientific expertise. People in general, experts and non-experts alike, want to feel heard and understood, not talked down to. Don't ever think in terms of dumbing it down, which I sometimes hear. That is absolutely the wrong approach, approach to cooperative communication. Just like a bridge makes a location accessible, make your communication style accessible to the audience in question. So now that I'm talking about bridges, real or metaphorical, we don't need to define terms, but sometimes we do need to consider what we call the prototype that an individual sees when thinking or hearing about a word or a concept. So don't answer this question, but I want you to think for a moment and picture a bridge. What do you see in your mind's eye when you think of a bridge? This personal prototype is influenced by your experience and your association with bridges. So, for example, my mother, who grew up in New York, for her, the prototypical bridge is the Brooklyn Bridge. It is the bridge that she took back and forth from Brooklyn to Manhattan many times in her life. And it is a historical monument at the same time that is etched into the minds of many New Yorkers. I, however, grew up in South Florida. And the bridges that I knew well were the bridges that simply provide a means to get from one side of the many canals to the other. Nothing more, nothing less. So you see that there are major differences between my mother's bridge and my bridge. 
But the main characteristic important to the story that I'm about to tell is the distance, okay, between the roads and the water beneath the, the bridges here. Storytelling is an effective method for communicating because it taps into our basic emotions in a way that facts and figures never will. While storytelling, the storytelling strategy has historically been rejected by most scientists because stories do not tell the whole truth, recently the scientific community has increasingly embraced storytelling as a way of communicating with non-experts about their field. So here's my short anecdote to illustrate what happens when two communicators have two different prototypes of a bridge. When I was a teenager, like many teenagers, I asked to do something that my mother wouldn't allow. And like many teenagers, my argument of why she should allow me was, but all my friends are doing it. So what came next? A, psychologic, a psychological question. My, I should say my mother was a social worker um, in, when she worked. So psychology was part of her technique. So she asked, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? Uh, since my mother and I had two totally different bridges in mind, she expected me to say no. Of course I wouldn't jump off the Brooklyn Bridge and break my neck just because all my friends are doing it. To her surprise, I instead answered, sure, why not? Thinking to myself, it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside or 40 degrees Celsius in that range outside. And jumping into the canal and swimming with my friends sounds like a fabulous idea. So I didn't communicate my thoughts out loud to my mother. And because I didn't do that, she responded with, really, in complete shock. And I said, yeah, of course, thinking my mother was being completely overprotective. So the conversation ended with an authoritative, no, you are not doing that thing just because your friends are, end of discussion. So because of the different prototypes for bridges, the angry teenager stomps off to her room feeling mistreated and misunderstood. And the mother is left speechless, wondering if her teenage daughter is going through one of those dangerous emotional roller coasters that lead them to making life-changing mistakes just to fit in and follow the crowd, like joining a cult or something. So by the way, you can use this um, situation with other um, scenarios with jumping off a bridge. For example, uh, my daughter told me yesterday, they use, if your friends jump out a window and she mentioned to me, um, obviously if you grow up in an area that only has one story buildings, you'll have a different picture in your mind than if your parent who uses the jump out the window question grew up in some high rise in a mega city, same thing. In other words, the result of two different prototypes can lead to a major case of miscommunication. Okay, so I'd like to focus now on communicating sustainability. And in order to do so, um, you need to understand what I'm referring to when I say sustainability, because as Juan says, choice of words and visuals matter greatly in communication. So I'm not talking about a picture of three pillars that are holding up a building, but I'm talking about three circles that mean sustainability only when they're interconnected. I'm also not talking about people, planet, and profit, which a lot of businesses use because it sounds so great with the three Ps, but to me, profit certainly does not equal economics. So here in this model, which um, I prefer, um, the ecological refers to, quote, the relationship of living organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. And environment refers to, quote, the natural world in which people, animals, and plants live, unquote. Those, those um, definitions also come from uh, the Oxford Dictionary. When communicating sustainability, you need to decide how to communicate to your audience. And this is where the difference between 
the term scientific communication, which is done between researchers, university students, and professors, and is what we saw yesterday in all the presentations, versus science communication. Okay, so note the difference, scientific versus science. Science communication is the communication of science mainly to non-experts, and um, this can include what many refer to as the general public, but that communication studies experts often refer to as publics, plural, because there is no one general public. There are only um, publics made of, of diverse people, okay? So here's a quotation by linguist Deborah Tannen regarding the difference between scientific and science communication. When I write for general audiences, I can't say much of what I know because it would take too long to explain. In my academic writing, I can't say much of what I know because I can't prove it. It's exactly this first sentence that scientists need to keep in mind when communicating to non-experts. You need to dedicate a lot of time to providing explanations and examples rather than simply providing evidence. So just as a side note, um, Deborah Tannen has written a lot about intercultural, intergenerational communication as well as gender and discourse, including intersectionality. Um, so if you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask at the end of this uh, presentation. In addition to the difference that Tannen describes, the entire structure of communication differs. Um, this is put out by AAAS. They are the same people who publish Science Magazine, which is um, one of the biggest um, science and technology ma magazines in the US, Nature being the equivalent in um, England. And they have some great sites on how to um, deal with different audiences. And this slide, just to be clear, um, these are models for two particular types of communication. They by no means represent all types of scientific and science communication. But um, what you see here in the triangle on the left um, is that when researchers communicate to other researchers, you move from the general, and that's represented by the wide part of this triangle starting up there, kind of like a funnel, okay? Um, so you start off with the wide background, then you, you focus it more with su supporting details, and finally you come to a pinpoint um, with the results and the conclusions. The triangle on the right, however, shows a different structure. When researchers communicate to non-experts, here is labeled public, but again, there is no one public. There are many diverse publics. You start at the most narrow point, um, which they describe as the bottom line, which for our purposes is your message, your main message, okay? The so what that you see down here, um, is a major point in English communication, especially in the US, being that I come from the US, I'm much more familiar with that than I am with other varieties of English. So I don't wanna generalize and say that this is also um, typical of every variety of English, but it, it certainly is of American English. So this so what means that you as a researcher need to make sure that you are explaining why your message is important. So what, what does it bring to my life? Yeah, why is it relevant to me as the audience member? And finally, then you broaden it out with the supporting details, the examples and explanation last. When you have internalized these differences in audiences, you will be able to communicate effectively with both types of audiences. 
a guideline that I highly recommend to help you in your quest to communicate sustainability to non-experts is Rachel James's Promoting Sustainable Behavior. This guideline, which can be found on the University of California Berkeley website, gives evidence-based tips for how to attract the audience's attention, how to make memorable messages, and how to use persuasive messages and strategies. One exercise that I would like to do with you in the workshop is to practice how to define your audience and finding strategies for promoting sustainable behavior for that particular audience, which James has done here for three groups, students, faculty, and staff at UC Berkeley. Faculty means professors, okay? Staff means the administration um, and all of the research assistants, et cetera. Since we'll be dealing with communicating sustainable mobility in the workshop, I'd like to give you a few examples from the mobility sector that use some of the strategies mentioned in James's guideline for promoting sustainable behavior. On this slide, you'll see an example of alliteration, which means using the same initial sound for each word. By the way, this was used in making messages memorable. Here, the transformative your urban mobility initiative uses T's to make the memorable message, talking transport transformation, which certainly rolls off the tongue better than discussing the transformation of urban sustainability. It's unclear here whether Toomey uses transport as a synonym for mobility or not, but the alliteration works in any case. And Toomey also uses another strategy here, the acronym, which SIGME does as well. Again, Toomey in this case rolls off the tongue much better than transformative urban mobility initiative. Here's another example of making messages memorable through acronyms, namely STEP, which stands for Steps Towards Empowering Pedestrians. And of course, don't forget that pictures are worth a thousand words and pictures are also a form of communication as is any art form of art. So in this case, you see a very well thought out E in step, which is in the form of a crosswalk or the metaphorical zebra stripes, which makes the message even more memorable. As a final example for this section on communicating sustainable mobility, I'd like to highlight our very own Berlin Public Transportation Network, which I'll refer to in its German abbreviation, BVG, since I've lived here for so long that it is simply not natural for me to say BVG in English. <clears throat> in this promotional ad, the BVG uses wordplay. Heartily yellow, but green at heart. Heartily yellow, but green at heart has several functions here. First, it refers to the company's branding campaign. This very yellow BVG heart that you see here and everywhere else in Berlin. And for the occasion, I have, I'm using my, which you cannot see very well because of my focus is off, but my BVG cup. Repetition, by the way, this heart, which you see everywhere with the BVG symbol, is also um, a key strategy used in communication. And of course, um, green at heart is meant to connect to a particular audience who's interested in how BVG deals with environmental concerns, like myself, who typed BVG and sustainability into my search engine with the hope of finding a perfect example for this workshop. Okay, so now for the final part of this presentation, I'd like to introduce another guideline put out by UC Berkeley, which we'll be working with in this workshop. I quoted Scott Shigeoka earlier, um, which came from his Bridging Differences playbook. 
I'd like to just go through the table of contents to show you the three types of skills needed for bridging differences, and then we'll practice a few of them in the workshop together. The first section includes intrapersonal skills, which we will not practice today because as it says here, these are skills to practice on your own. They include the following, assume good intentions on the part of your conversational partner, practice mindfulness, expand your activities, expand your views. And this, by the way, was talked about yesterday in the discussions concerning your comfort zone. So what he's talking about here is that you should purposely do activities that are outside, outside of your comfort zone so that you can expand your views, okay? Um, seek counter stereotypical information. Focus on, identi uh, on individuality and not group identity. This is obviously um, key when you're dealing on a, on a global level as well. On this slide, you see interpersonal skills, some of which I have mentioned in this presentation and which we, some of which we'll practice in the workshop. Number one, listen with compassion. Number two, put people before politics. Number three, give and take with perspective. Okay, that has to do with the, what he says, um, you are not the all-knowing perspective. Okay, give and take with that. Find shared identities. That has to do with finding common ground, which I talked about earlier. Understand, take the time to understand your conversational partner's values. And lastly, try self-distancing, which we're not going to do in this, but basically um, that has to do with taking a step back from yourself, especially if you're overly emotional about an issue, because when you're emotional, uh, your rationality goes out the window. If you've ever been in love and you have those rosy-eyed um, love glasses on, all rationality goes out the window, okay? That's what we're dealing with when we're talking about E.O. Wilson's uh, paleolithic emotions. So there are strategies for taking a step back from your own emotionality so that you can build bridges with people with a different opinion. Finally, the third type of skill involves intergroup strategies, strategies for bringing people together, which we're not going to be able to practice within the framework of this workshop because these include um, sometimes very long term strategies. Um, one that's mentioned is um, a group that brings Palestinians and Israelis together, and they don't start talking about the issue until a year after they've done lots of other exercises. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how long term these strategies really are. But I do encourage you to read about them so that you can practice them at a later time and develop your own long term approach to community to communication. So these include create conditions for the contact, identify common goals, focus on solutions, not identities. Okay. And um, in conclusion, successful science communication has a lot in common with uh, work in sustainability, which as you all know, requires long term thinking, patience, and above hard work. So does communication. So I hope this presentation has attracted your attention to that topic. And I hope that I've provided you with a basis for cooperative communication in the realm of sustainability in general and sustainable mobility in particular. I look forward to now ending my monologue and having a dialogue with you in which I look forward to listening to you in the workshop. Thank you very much.